Well, good morning, church. How are you? You are looking great. Are you glad to be here? Listen, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome those watching at home, whether you're sick or you're just watching from a long distance. We're glad you tuned into fellowship. And if you are here today as a guest for your first time or your second time, thanks for coming. You know, you could have went anywhere else today. But we're really, uh, we're really glad that you chose here, and I hope today is a blessing to you. Church, can we just give a hand and welcome our guest this morning to church? Since I have my phone out, I'm going to invite you all to go ahead and take your phones out right now. Take your phones out, and I want you to check in for worship. If you've never done this before, you can simply open your camera app and scan that code right in front of you. Uh, scan that code, check in. When you check in for worship today, would you please let us know how we can pray for you? There's a little prayer request form on there. We just want to know what's going on in your life and how we can support you, and we're excited to be able to do that today. You know, when you come to church, uh, this, is, this is family. You're here amongst friends here, you're here amongst family, and we're here for each other. So uh, we want you to know that. We want you to be able to let us know how we can pray for you. Uh, have you ever had an opportunity, a really good opportunity? Raise your hand if, you had, if you've ever had a great opportunity in life. Opportunity is different than an obligation, right? An obligation is something you have to do, and an opportunity something you get to do. And I, I got to tell you that over the past week and, and coming up here, God is really lining our church up for some opportunities and lining you up for some opportunities to be sharing the gospel in our community. For me, that, that's one of the most exciting things that I get to be a part of. It's, it's only so often in life that Jesus gives a command to do something and you get to actually live out and experience that command. Uh, for example, uh, Jesus told us to go, but then he told us to baptize. And today it's really awesome that in the service today, we are literally doing exactly what Jesus commanded us to do. Uh, you're going to get to hear an incredible testimony uh, of how God is working through a man named Eli. And he's here today in the service. I get to baptize him toward the end of the service. It's going to be incredible. But God didn't just give us the command to baptize. It all starts off with him telling us to go. This past Thursday, I, I got to share some good news with you. Uh, you'll see some photos on the screen. We had this event, and we called it Prayer Stop, okay? Th this is with our GO team, which is our effort to reach our community with the gospel message. And we, uh, we had some crazy people standing out in the hot sun. And I tell you, it was hot out there. I was out there. And we were holding up these signs, and the signs invited people simply to come onto the property and let us pray with you. It said, uh, how can we pray for you or, or stop for prayer, turn now. And uh, we had 16 people come through our church in the two-hour period for prayer. Can we praise God for that? Imagine it was your bad day at work. And you just happen to be driving home. And there's this group of people out there smiling waving at you while you're driving home stuck at the traffic light and they just said hey can I can I take your need to God can I pray for you can I show you a little care it was so, such a blessing uh, out of those 16 people there was one man I don't know if he's even here today uh, is he here today awesome where's he at there's my man I made a new friend I want to give a hand for Jake Jake, I don't normally call anybody out in this service, but I know you're a tough man and you can take that. Uh, you know what? Jake, I'll give a praise and a testimony of what God's doing in his life. He just stopped by and Jake asked Jesus to save him on Thursday night. We praise God for that. Thank you for coming. And we do these things as an opportunity the Bible says we are laborers together with God. Somehow you have a chance to say yes to something in your life and God gets to work through you. We're laborers with him. 
It's not all about just, God, oh, I pray you'd save our community. God, I pray you'd encourage people in our community. God, solve the problems in our community. No, it's God's going to use you to say yes to an opportunity to see that take place. The Bible says we, us, the church, are ambassadors for Christ. That means we're his representatives. Well, it's time that we do some representing, don't you think? And uh, this is what our church is all about, helping people find and follow Jesus. I want to tell you about just a couple things coming up that are chances for you to say yes to be used for God's, God's work. This coming Thursday night, which happens the second and fourth of every Thursday uh, of every month, we have our family pantry ministry. The family pantry is simply a tool. Yes, we will feed somewhere around 50 people in, uh, in a couple hour window here at our church. They'll get so much good food. But those people that come, they're gonna meet Christians, God's ambassadors, and they're gonna get an opportunity to go into a prayer room and meet some people that are gonna ask them about their soul. They're gonna care about who they really are. They're gonna talk to them about Jesus. And I wanna invite you to sign up with your family. You can bring your whole family, sign up with your life group or your ministry team. Just find some friends in church and say, hey, will you, will you join me for the family pantry? It's so easy. And it's one of the most fun things we do just to help people shop or to greet people as they come in or to push some carts out and load groceries into somebody's car. You can do that and uh, you're able to. It's an opportunity to say yes. Also, I want to tell you about something new that we're doing that we just haven't done in a long time. We are beginning something next month on October 14th. I want you to, if you already have your phones out, look up that day, uh, October 14th from 10 o'clock until 1230. We're calling it Go and Share Saturday. Go and Share Saturday is something where we're inviting every family in this church, every person that can walk, every person that's able to get out and go into the neighborhood. See, God placed us here right next to a whole neighborhood of people. They live there every day. They go on, on these streets every day. And you know what? God put our church right here because he wants us to go reach those people right over there. And so uh, we have three of these Go and Share Saturdays scheduled over this coming season. And we are going to go. It's really simple. We're going to walk over there with our friends from church, and we're going to put some things on every door in this area, every single one. We've got it all mapped out. We're ready to go. And uh, this first one, we're going to let them know about Trunk or Treat. We've got an event where we're inviting everybody right here. People are already getting out to go and trying to get a whole bunch of sugar around Halloween. And you know what? We have an opportunity for them to come here, get their sugar, but they're going to meet God's ambassadors right here. They're going to meet you, and they're going to get an opportunity to hear the gospel, to, to be influenced for Christ. And so my invitation for you is to come out on October 14th as we go and share the good news uh, across the street here in our own backyard. Also, uh, coming up here, you can check the Church Center app. We have a, a time where we're packing bags for the homeless. Uh, we are really just doing what we can do to say yes to those opportunities God gives us. So I invite you to say yes. Uh, look up those, uh, those events in the Church Center app. And please sign up and be a part. Uh, you'll be blessed by it. Well, let's all stand together. We're going to kick this off with some worship. We're going to sing and uh, praise the Lord. Let's do it together. We learned this song the last couple weeks. We believe the Bible is true. For 59 years, this church has believed to preach the Bible. We will continue. This is what we believe. Let's see. I, I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion by his blood I have been set free I believe in the resurrection hallelujah his life is destiny all praise all praise to God the Father all praise to Christ the Son all praise to the Holy Spirit Hey! 
Oh, praise God. Praise God. Let me shout, shout amen. amen. <laughs> we believe the Bible is true. We take that gospel to the world. Sing this song.
shout amen. amen. Oh, praise God. Please be seated. Hello, my name is Eli Silverio, and my story starts about a year ago when I turned 20. And on my 20th birthday, I decided to write down a list of all the things that I would like to accomplish in the next five to 10 years. And when I finished writing out the list, I looked at the list and I thought most of the things were shallow, empty, meaningless. I just thought overall it was a bad list. I felt that if I accomplished everything that I had put down on the list, I would still feel like I didn't accomplish much in the grand scheme of things. None of the stuff mattered. And I felt like I would still have this hole. And around this time I was in New York, I was going to school and I decided to take a year off and move in with my mom in Columbus. So that's what brought me to Columbus. And while I'm here, I felt very hollow, felt very empty, felt like I was looking for something that I might be good at, something that I was searching for. I was very anxious. And one day while I'm watching Netflix, somebody knocks on my door and this guy, this person invites me to come to church with him. And so I said, oh yeah, I'll go to church with you. And he hands me a Bible and it's a Mormon Bible. And I said, well, I don't know nothing about Mormonism, but..." I told him I'd go to church with him so I could at least hear him out. So I go to church with him and when I come back, my mom sees the Bible on my table and she says, have you been going to a Mormon church? And I said, yeah. And then she said, okay, well, you know, I didn't raise you Mormon, right? And I said, yeah, you're right. I didn't, I wasn't raised Mormon. So I figured, well, let me look for a Christian church around me. And that's when I found FBC, and I said, okay, well, next Sunday, I'm gonna go to that church. I met Eli on the last Sunday of May. He had been coming to church just a few weeks. I walked up to him, introduced myself. We had a nice talk, and uh, I said, man, I hope you come back. And he said, I will be back. And he came back the very next week. And I went up to Eli, I shook his hand again, and I said, man, I'm glad you came back. Eli looked at me and he said, uh, is, what can I do to get involved? And he asked something about doing something at the church or uh, doing more at the church. And I was going to mention some of our programs and activities and all the, you know, the neat stuff that we have. He, instead, I looked at him and I said, if he died, do you know if he'd go to heaven? And his face has kind of changed and he just kind of stopped and he goes, I don't think I know the answer to that. I took his Bible that he had there and I went to the back of the auditorium. It was just four minutes before the next service and I started to show him uh, the gospel. Every answer I showed him, he had like more questions. And I realized, my goodness, we're not gonna get this done before the service starts. I had to get up on the platform to lead the singing. And so I told him, I said, stay here, don't leave. And I ran up to the front, we led the worship, and then after I led the worship, I went and got him. And we went back to my office and the entire second service, we sat and we talked about Jesus, how he wanted to save him, and we talked about the gospel. So I asked Matt a lot of uh, questions about what he was telling me, and I was just so confused because I could be saved today I could know for certain today where I'm gonna go when I die. Uh, I was also really confused because I just never heard this before. I've been in churches in and out of my life numerous times, and I never had someone sit me down and tell me, this is how you get saved, this is what salvation is. And I just had a lot of questions. I was like, well, how can I be saved? I'm not read up on my Bible. I don't know everything about gospel. I don't know the full story of Jesus. Uh, how on earth can I be saved? When I leave here, I know I'm gonna continue to live in my sin. I know I'm gonna sin when I leave here. I'm not perfect yet, how can I be saved? I explained to you how God said we have to come to him like little kids. And we confuse it with our adulthood and our uh, 
complicated thinking and God said, no, 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 did, is the Bible true? Did God say he would keep his word? Did he say he would save you if you'd ask him? And you said, yes, yes, yes. And of course, then what's the thing to say? And I asked you, I didn't even tell you what to say. I was just like, so what do you think you should do? And I remember you said, um, I want to be saved. So bowed my head, repented. I knew I had to repent. And I didn't know what exactly I had to say, but I just said what I felt like I should have said. Of course, then you got to the place where you're like, if I could get a little help. And then uh, I prayed with you and um, you were saved that day. After I got saved, uh, Matt explained to me that once you get saved, the next step is to get baptized, but baptism doesn't save you. So in my mind, I was like, well, if baptism doesn't save you, then, you know, when that day comes, it'll come, but it's not nothing I'm rushing towards, you know, because I was still grappling with the idea of salvation. Yeah. I didn't understand that I was saved, that I could go out, do whatever I want. I'm a child of God now, and I'll, I'll be saved. And uh, one day I step out of line, I do something, and uh, like a splash of cold water, it hits my face, and I realize, okay, I can't just do whatever I want. I can't just live however I want. There's rules I gotta follow. I felt a roof form over my head. I felt coldness. I felt very scared. I felt like a great amount of shame was on me. Like I just felt it on my chest. A great amount of shame was on me. And I felt like I damaged the relationship with God. Like, like I was separated from God for a moment. And it was one of the scariest feelings I've ever had. And so I repented. I repented that night and I said, okay, well, whatever is the next step, that's the step I need to take. I can't follow my rules. I can't follow what the rules that society thinks is okay. I can't follow that. I need to follow what God said. I need to follow God's rules. And I know it won't lead me stray. I know it's only gonna better me and I'm just gonna put my faith in it. Even if it doesn't make sense, I just need to follow it. And uh, you know, that's when Matt said, well, the next step is baptism. We follow baptism because that's what Jesus said. We need to just obey him and follow him. And that's when I knew, okay, well, I want to get baptized. I want to get baptized as soon as possible. And funny enough, when I first came to FBC, when I decided I was going to start attending church, I was just okay with just being in the back, back row, listen to the sermon, listen to everyone. I wasn't going to get too involved, I was going to get in, get whatever I felt like I needed, and then I was going to leave, and funny enough, I didn't see myself getting baptized, but now I'm going to get baptized, and it's been a beautiful journey, and it's been great, honestly, and I'm excited just to continue to follow Jesus and take that next step. Isn't that just awesome? I love it. It's so powerful. It just the, the power of the gospel. It just and um, it, it fires me up just hearing uh, Eli's testimony for a number of reasons. One, um, that the Mormons are so passionate about giving out false truth. Did you guys get that part? And for anybody that's here that's like, oh, you, you're dogging the Mormons. Absolutely, I'm dogging the Mormons. Um, they believe that Jesus and Satan are brothers, okay? It's a false, it's a false through and through. It's, it's not another denomination, just so you know. It is a cult, um, and they're after people. And uh, the Bible says that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And uh, Jesus is the Son of God. He wasn't brothers with Satan. And uh, it's, it, there's all sorts of false truths out there that is... Uh, terrible that we have to make sure that we're aggressive with delivering the gospel. We talk about living in the last days. Well, living in the last days doesn't mean that we just uh, complain about culture changing. It doesn't mean that we get upset because people aren't receiving truth. That means we aggressively go out and make a difference. Do you notice the second part of his story? The second part of his story is the fact that when he came to church, that people reached out to him. 
Think about if he would have just gone through here and everybody would just gone about their daily business and like, oh, we've got lunch and let's go out here and talk to people we've talked to. You never know who's sitting in the chair, sitting in the pew next to you right now that needs you. So they need Jesus. Well, you have Jesus, okay? So we're, we're all ambassadors of, uh, of the gospel. So let's go out of our way to make sure that every time that we're here, we're, we're demonstrating Jesus Christ by giving hospitality and loving and caring for people. That, that, that whole thing right there would preach by itself. It is so powerful. Uh, take your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we went through verses 1 through 3. We're going we're gonna to hit verse 4 today. Uh, but before we get there, I, I, want to, I want to just touch on something because we're, we're beginning the story of the journey about talking about different people uh, in, the, in the Gospels that lived out uh, this faith. And, and it's the, the, for 40 verses of chapter 11, it's all about faith. And, and mo- the majority of that is explaining how people live this out. It wasn't just a matter of like, I have faith. It's a matter of let me show you what it looks like in life. But in John 10, 10, when Jesus was speaking to the disciples, and he said, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's what he does. He takes from families. He robs your joy. He robs your identity. He, he, he destroys happiness, fulfillment, all these different things. That's what he does. But Jesus responded, and he said that I've come that you might have life. Praise God that God said that you pass from death unto life. He makes us alive. The, the baptism story that we have when we do that, and Eli will be doing this in just a minute, is a fact buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. But Jesus didn't leave it there. I think sometimes we get satisfied with just the fact, woohoo, I'm going to heaven. God said, I didn't just save you to redeem you from hell. That I didn't save you just to deliver you to heaven. There's more to the life. He said that I've come that you might have life and that you might have that life more abundantly. Now, I know a lot of people will preach this uh, of wealth and prosperity gospel. You serve Jesus, go to your mailbox, and there's going to be a check for $10,000 or whatever. The, the, let me tell you, I, I'd be thrilled if you found a check for $10,000. Take me out to lunch. We'll talk about it together, okay? We'll, we'll celebrate the $10,000. But that's not what the verse is talking about. He's saying that you might have life more abundantly, not just stuff in life. That, that life that he's talking about that you might have it more abundantly is the fact that you will have fulfillment and satisfaction and purpose to live out this life. God has created us for more in life. To run after things. To, to not just not be satisfied with just life being average or mediocre or I'm just getting by or I'm just, I'm just here. No, we're not meant to be just here. And I, I can prove it because Hebrews 11, 4 through 40 is all about people that said, wait a minute. If God has an abundant life, abounding in life, I want some of it. I'm not going to just be satisfied with just the average things of life. I'm going to run after it. But the key to everything that every single one of them did was faith. Take out faith. There's no experience in God in that way. And I think this is important for us to get. Hebrews 11.1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Now let me show you something that maybe that sometimes we misunderstand about this passage. We talk about by it, faith, that they received uh, a, a good report of God. And we take it from the, from the perspective that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joshua and Rahab and Esther and all them were, were able to be used by God in a big way. And I cannot, for, I cannot deny that. They were used by God in a big way. But it's, that's not all that it says. There, there's more to it. It's not just a matter of that we look back at them as an example. But that Greek phrase, obtained a good report, means to be a witness of. To testify. It, it literally means to bear record of something. To obtain a good and honest report to be well reported of. So it has both sides of it. God is telling us that if you want to see an example of what it means to live out faith, I'm going to take you to Noah, and I'm going to take you to Abraham, and I'm going to show you what they did. But on the flip side of it, it says that they obtained something. Can I tell you what they obtained? On the flip side of them stepping out on faith, 
Noah was able to say, I built a boat when there was no way of water coming, and I, I was able to stand back and watch animals line up two by two as I stood there with my family saying, only God could do that. It was Daniel that testified that said, I was in the lion's den. I heard the purrs of the lions. I heard their growls. I felt their fur as it passed by me as they walked around me. Elijah could stand back and say, I was there when the fire fell and I felt the heat on my face. I was able to experience. Moses could stand back and say, I felt the wind of God as it came down and separated the Red Sea. It blew back my hair. I stood there with goosebumps as I experienced and had a touch of God in my life. It's not just about the fact that they were used by God. It was about them being able to stand back and say, I saw God. I experienced God firsthand. So we don't experience that today. Do we leave out faith? Is that, is, is that the missing ingredient of what we have? It says, for by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. By it, by faith, they witnessed God do great things. Let me tell you this. You will never witness great moves of God without great steps of faith. If you're satisfied with just Hearing the stories, then, 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 then that's, that's where you're going to leave it. But God said, I gave you the story of Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Rahab and, and Esther and all that for you to be like, wow, look what God did. And I'm not looking to call down fire from heaven, which I think would be cool. Especially sometimes in road rage situations, like I think that would be cool. But I, I think it'd be awesome for, for whatever God has for me and my family and you and your family to be able to experience God do great things of whatever your situation, your journey is. But I know what you're thinking. These are heroes of the faith. I mean, we read these stories and we're like, man, I'm, I'm definitely no Abraham. I'm definitely no Isaac. Can I tell you one thing that every one of these guys had in common is the fact that they messed up. Did you guys ever notice that? Every one of their stories, they could be, it's not heroes of the faith, they could be failures of the faith. You say, oh, I can't believe you said that. Read their stories. Every one of their stories, every single one of them. Abraham that we're going to get into next week, which is the next sequence of these stories. Abraham lied about his wife being his sister. Twice. He did it twice. Moses that was able to experience, you know, the, 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 the Red Sea being split. He also smote the rock because God told him not to do it. He did it anyways. David, you know, the one that brought down Goliath, had an affair, cheated, and then had the guy murdered. Before we get to Hebrews 11, Jesus testifies, or the Bible testifies of this, and he says in Hebrews 10, 17, in their sins, in their iniquities, will I remember no more. You say they were heroes of the faith. They, they were just people that experienced grace and still walked by faith. So here I, I want to I testify to every person here. You qualify to be able to walk a journey of faith and experience God in this way. Now let's get into this. The, I, I want to go back to verse 1. I want to touch on this because we need to make application again to what we're going to study in these passages. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We studied faith. The word faith right there means just trust and confidence. Okay, we, we, we use this as an illustration of this when we were talking about the bridge. Let me take you back to the bridge. The bridge is something that if we're going to go across, we have to have faith and confidence. Because I promise you, if that failed, you would die. So, we're in, in, and it just shows that we live out faith all the time. We're, we're going through something like that. We don't slam on our brakes and get out and go, what's going on, honey? Man alive, I want to make sure this bridge is okay. We go around kicking the metal and, you know, shaking the edges of it. No, no, we, we just go across it. You say, why is that? I, 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 this bridge has been here for years. It's, it's held up the cars in front of us. I see cars on the other side of this. I have faith or confidence that I can step into this and it's going to hold me up and take me to the other side because that is, that is I trust it. And I have enough confidence that I'm going to put all my family in the car and take them to the other side. Faith is just trust and confidence. That's easy. Because the second illustration that I gave you was the fact that what if you come to a bridge in the middle of the woods and you step back and you're thinking, I, I don't have as much faith and confidence in that. 
But can we just be real about something? That is more of the journey that God's called us to. Because it's the evidence of things not seen. I don't know if God's going to send rain when I'm building the boat. I don't know if I build this altar and I douse it full of water that fire's going to fall. I don't know if I run to a giant with just a rock that that's enough to bring down that giant. See, a lot of times God brings us to things that there's no evidence seen for us to know that it's going to work. But I still move forward because the path that he's taking me, the path that he's calling us down, is his word. That is what, I'm not putting the faith and confidence in me because that's what I said last week. We're like, you're like, man, I, 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 do I have enough faith? Well, go ahead and stand at the front of that bridge and psych yourself up. I've got the faith. I can do this. Man, I know I can do this. Man, I'm going I'm to listen to a song and I'm going to psych myself up. You can do that all day long. That doesn't change the situation. But do you understand if God's the one that built that bridge or that's the path that God did, I can walk out on it because I'm putting my faith and confidence in God, not in myself. So the more we build this up that I hope I have enough faith, then you put the faith in you rather than the, situ- rather than the God that you're serving. The reason why Noah was successful because he said, and Noah believed God. God led him to this. And so let me tell you this. That right there is Pastor and Mrs. Denoff coming to Columbus, Ohio to, to, to start a church with nothing. So what do we have? I don't know. Is that going to hold us? I don't know. But God called us here. That, that, is, that is a cancer journey right there. That, that is what that is. That is like, I, I, I don't know if this is going to work, and I don't know what advice to follow, and I don't know, but God put us here, so therefore I'm going to keep going even though faith is scary. You're going to learn that as we go through this. A lot of times you're like, I've got faith, and let's just charge into this. I promise you with all of my heart that Daniel had goosebumps on the back of his neck as he went into the lion's den. A lot of us, I would like, he went, you know, skipping in there, like, you know, like he just going to go pet a lion or whatever. No, I promise you. Faith is scary. Faith, when you get out there, is going to shake. The the bridge is going to sway. The question is, are you going to keep going because what you have in your head? Let let me me give you a verse that illustrates faith that that is pretty powerful that a lot of you know already. But maybe you've never applied that, that this is a verse talking about faith. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lay not on your own understanding. Do you know what the word trust is? It's faith and confidence. That's what that word is. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the bridge, the path, the direction that he's taking you with all your heart. What is your heart? It's conviction. That is like literally convinced that I know that my God cannot fail. And my God doesn't lead me to ever fail. So faith is confidence in the Lord. But you can't lean on your own understanding. Looking at the bridge going, uh, man, I don't know. Man, I don't know if we should give to that project. I, I don't know if I should sign up for that mission trip. Man, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of money. But didn't God put it on our hearts? I know. I know he did. I don't know if I could, I, I could teach that class. Didn't, God, didn't you say that God put a bird on your heart? Man, I know, but man, I'm just not good with words. See, that is, don't lean on your, on, on your own understanding because in all of your ways, you have to acknowledge him and you know what he's going to do? He's going to direct your paths. You know what that means? That God's going to take you to some scary stuff. And that's where faith comes in because a lot of us are like, man, I want the faith of Daniel. And then God brings us to the bridge and we're like, oh, maybe I don't. Because faith is scary. I I, I want to take you to the first example of this. And we're just going to hit one main verse today and then we'll be done. This is the first example that we come to. This is going to be my first time of using this illustration, but I wasn't going to skip it because when, when God says, let me give you an illustration, he gives the first one, he talks about a guy that doesn't make sense. Now, I, I, I get the fact that Daniel did what he did, and, and, and David, man, well, what a perfect example. By faith, David brought down Goliath with a rock. Now, that's an illustration of faith. That, that's something that we would paint uh, a, a mural in a, in a nursery or whatever, like, man, I want to inspire the kids like that. But I'll tell you, when it says, by faith, Abel, nobody ever paints this dude's picture on anything. You, you know what I'm saying? It's not like when we talk about heroes of the faith, no kid has ever said, I want to grow up to be like Abel. I mean, like, who does that? 
on, on, on kids' Bible covers, on pictures of your house, murals in churches. When, I, I mean, nobody ever puts him as one of the heroes of the faith. We almost stand back and be like, dude, how'd you get in there? I mean, how, how, how did that dude sneak in here when, when you say, what did he do? He gave God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, that it being dead, that he being dead, yet speaketh. It doesn't start with it. It says, by faith, Abel. Well, when we get in these stories, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense of this. And you say, what was the wrap up in a nutshell, Pastor Tony, the story of Abel? He gave an offering, ticked off his brother, and died. I mean, literally, that is the full story of, of Cain and Abel, or, or, or of Abel at least. But let's go back. Why is he mentioned here as a person of faith? He was 11-4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Okay, so this is about offering to God in sacrificial living. That is what this is about. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So the offering unto God or his offering unto God was an act of obedience or an act of worship. The very beginning, before we get into people throwing rocks or building boats or Abraham offering Isaac, it starts with one basic principle, and that is offering unto God. So that's a weird thing to start with. Well, not to God, to the point where the Bible says in the end of verse 4, and by it, by his offering, he able, being dead, yet speaketh. God literally says, this guy, even though you're thinking that there's not much to his life, the acts of obedience that he lived out had such an impact on pleasing God that God said, I'm going to record it in Scripture and have that message preached for generations to come. And if God did that, then it must be vitally important that God says when he's writing out Scriptures of faith, that God says, start with Abel. That dude knew how to please me. That dude knew how to walk by faith. So how do you do this? Two simple points. Number one, how to move forward by faith. Number one, you have to have the right heart. You have to have a heart that is right. And the Bible spells this out. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. Now, now let me show you something. Both of them sacrificed unto God. Do you guys notice that? One sacrifice uh, of, the, of the fruits and the other one sacrifice of the animal. So it's not a matter of obedience. And I've heard this preached in some way that, that Cain disobeyed God. And, and we'll, we'll kind of debate that here in a second about why did God honor one over the other. But I can tell you at the, the heart of this, literally at the heart of this, is one did it from a righteous heart and one did not. So the question comes in, did, did he obey God? Or what, what was this all about? I know that Cain did not have a righteous heart because one, when God rejected his offering, he responded and went out and killed his brother. That's a good indication your heart's not right, just in case you're thinking about that, okay? So the story begins with the basics of honoring God. So here's the thing. Offering is acknowledging that all that we have comes from God. Now take it from the very beginning uh, of, of the passage. Uh, I mean, when I say the very beginning, go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Without God, there was nothing made that was made. Everything that God gave to Adam and Eve to enjoy came from God. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Where did light come from? It came from God. God said, let the earth bring forth green grass. Let it bring forth herbs. Let, let it bring forth uh, plants. And let, it, let, let, let there be animals. Let there be birds. Let there be fish in the sea. Everything that was there came from there. So when Adam and Eve passed it on, to Cain and Abel, it was a matter of everything that we have is not ours. It's been given to us by God. And Adam could even say, God put me in the garden to oversee it, but the garden belonged to God. Now, I know you're saying this is awfully simple, but you understand that this is the basics of a simplicity thing that God wanted us to get. And it says here in Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, if you get into the story itself, and she again bare her brother Abel, or his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it's a matter that God points out at the beginning of this that they, didn't, they weren't the same. If you have two kids, I promise you they're going to be quite different. One was a tiller of the ground. One was a keeper of the sheep. But both of them had to acknowledge that the sheep that I have and the plants that I grow and harvest have all come from God. You need to acknowledge in your life, every single one of us, that you work a job, you have a house, and you have a car. 
you don't own any of it. It's not yours. And I think that sometimes we, we build ourselves up like, look what I have done, and I have worked hard for what I have, and this belongs to me, and I'll do what I want. And God says, really? Do you know who I am? Every time we use the word Lord God in Scripture, the word Lord is Adonai. Do you know what Adonai means? It means master. You serve the master. All that you have belongs to God. Everything, every sheep that he had and everything that grew in the ground belonged to God. Now, God was pointing out that this was their livelihood. They had talents, they had income, they had all of these things, but it all belonged to God. We are simply managers of God's blessings because all that we have is his. Now, notice the second thing. Offering is simply offering or honoring God with what, we, with God, with what God has given us. Offering is simply honoring God with what he has given us. It says in verse 3 in Genesis chapter 4, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Now you think about it. He says in the process of time or the system that God established that they would plant, they would harvest, and in the process of time they would come and say, this came from you. Thank you. That's what the offering was. It was simply acknowledging that God gave us everything. Everything that we have, it's, it, it, it's simply the blessings of God. When the Bible talks about stewardship, when the Bible talks about offering, when the Bible talks about sacrifice, all of these things, it was a spiritual discipline to acknowledge that this belongs to you. And, and I, I think all the way from the very beginning, before there was houses and cars and chariots and all that other stuff that went out through history, it all started with whatever you have, literally going up to Cain and Abel, like, what do you got? I, 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 I plant plants. Well, I offer some of that to me. And the same thing with the, 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 the animals. It was like that belongs to me. It was a matter of acknowledging God in all that we do. Now, let me show you how David got this. David was a man after God's own heart. And he got this understanding of the offering as he was worshiping God. In 1 Chronicles 29, verse 12, both riches and honor come of thee. Where does it come from? David was like, man, I've got this figured out. He said, this one thing that I know, everything that I have, whether it's my bank account, wh whether it's, it's my house or my car, whatever, it comes from God. And thou reignest over all, you're in control. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thy hand is to make me great and to give strength to all. He said, everything that I have has come from God. And if I'm going to further anything in my life, I've got to acknowledge that it comes from God. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. I acknowledge, I, I worship you, I thank you, I give you the credit for this. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? It wasn't grudgingly like, well, here you go, this is what you want. It's like, man... God is so good. Who are we to have so much? Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for your goodness to me. We acknowledge all that we have. All things come of thee, and of thine own have we been given thee. This all belongs to God. It's funny how we don't mind giving sacrificially to the things that we love. But the question in, in God's priority and God's mind is, 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 do you love me? Are, are you going to sacrifice? Are you going to offer to me? Because we don't mind giving out to everything. And by the way, we're not just talking financial. And that's the first place our mind runs. It's the same thing with our time. Same thing with our treasures. Same thing with our possessions and our resources and everything. It's a matter of whether it's a lamb or corn. Do you put God as a priority? Now, notice the second thing, and I know this is kind of debated, but let me show you. How we move forward by faith is you have to have a heart that is right. We acknowledge every blessing that I have comes from God, and I honor God with what I have. But the second part is, Abel put God first. This is a basic principle. It's not the first time that I've preached this, and I think it is important that we understand this, that Abel put God first. And in verse 2, and it says, And she again bare her brother Abel. His brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. 
And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his, to his offering. Now I've heard this said, and I'm sure you guys have heard this said as well. And I just, I kind of want to debate it and just throw it out there to see what our thinking is. That God honored Cain, or Abel because he brought a blood sacrifice. And that makes sense because if you go back to Genesis that he killed the animals and covered the nakedness of Adam and Eve with the, with the skin of the animal. And, and I know that's a principle that was lived out. Now, it wasn't put into a command till later. The literally is, is for a process of killing the animal, and God gave the instructions. If you go later in scriptures, especially in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all that other stuff, we have the instructions for that. It was not given to them yet. Plus, giving of what you had of the harvest was an offering that God commanded from the very beginning. Of what do you have put God first. Notice Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. What do we find out from that? That verse tells us from the very beginning that you are to take whatever you have and they were offered unto God. So it wasn't just the blood sacrifice that he was talking about. He said of the first of the first fruits. But let me emphasize something. It wasn't just bringing of the fruits of the ground. He said that the first of the first fruits. So it's literally the beginning of the beginning. You have a first harvest, you have corn, you have wheat, you have whatever it is. Whatever you take out of that first, that is what you're to bring God as an offering. The principle that God was saying to us in everything that we do is God must come first. In everything. Can I tell you guys that we live in a culture today that does not put God first? And we see that, man, when it comes to obedience of things and instructions of things or whatever it is, it is not. But I'm going to take you back to Genesis um, 4 3. And he says, in verse 3, he says that he brought of the fruit of the ground, which literally he had of it, and he was like, well, I'll, I'll take some of this and bring it to God. But when Abel did it, it was totally different. The Bible says in verse 4, and Abel brought of the firstlings of it. That, that, that's not just something that God threw in there. God was emphasizing even what he reiterated back in Exodus and the other passages, that God must come first. He brought of the firstlings of it. You say, why does that matter? Think about the application of this. If you were to, God's to bless you in so many ways, and you were just to take of your blessings and bring it to God, there is no faith involved. But let's take Abel's illustration. He's feeding a family. He's taking care of his family. He's doing all these things. And he has one lamb that's there. You can imagine bringing it to the family. He says, we have a lamb. This is our first baby. This, is, this came from God. God did this. This is so incredible. And they're like, dad, that's awesome. And it's like, man, I hope we have many more. I hope we do too, son. This one's God's. This one's God's. Wait a minute, why don't we add up more and just see where our status is? Why can't we just see what all we have to give? And, and if there's enough of it and whatever, and God says, no, that's not faith. Faith is when you only have one and you give it to God out of trust to God, praying and hoping and trusting that and having confidence that God, that God will give you more. Do you know why the story of Abraham is so powerful? Think about the story of Abraham and Isaac. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to bless you so much that your family will be counted as the sands of the sea. He had one kid. His name was Isaac. Do you know what God asked him to do with his one kid named Isaac? Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, and lay him upon the, offer, uh, on the altar. You know what he was asking God? Take what you have and give it to me, trusting in God that God will provide more. The whole idea of Abel was a matter of trusting God. The whole idea that God's asking Christians to live out their life is to trust God. It is not trusting God when you have a thousand sheep and you say, oh, I'll take that one. Okay, you can have this one. That's, that's, that's the best that I can do. But it's trusting God. And by the way, when God gave to us, it was also the same illustration. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
It was sacrifice, it was offering, it came from the heart, it was because of love, it was a question of that, it was, it was, it was motivated by love. And this is how it started. It is also about recognizing God's authority in our lives. The first book and the first chapter and the first verse of the first chapter says, in the beginning, God. It started with God, it belongs to God. Without God being first, there would be nothing to follow. Do you understand that the reason why it says in the beginning, God, because all things were made by him and not anything was made that was made. Everything came from God. Go back to the end. If you go to Revelation, uh, the end of Revelation, it says in chapter 22, verse 13, he said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the, bat, and the, first and the last. You know what God established at the very beginning of time? I come first. Do you know what he established at the end of time? I come first first. Do you know why that is so important for us to acknowledge? Because God has said to us as Christians, without me, you can do nothing. 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 That's not how we live. The whole illustration of Abel from the very beginning of it was the fact of, I want to establish that faith in every aspect of your life is putting God above all things. Above all things. Life began with God, life will end with God, and nothing works without God being first. If God is the source of all blessings and you pull him out, what kind of blessings do you have? If God is the source of all strength, God is the author of time. God is the one that gives you the, the ability to handle whatever's coming. If you pull God out of that, what do you have left? But we have a generation today that life is just so hard and it's not working out and I don't know what's going on and I love God. And God says, it's not a matter of just with your lips telling me that you love God. It's with the actual action of, there's a lamb. He's so cute. It's the first it's all we have. Son, bring him to daddy. Let's go. That one belongs to God. What, but dad, we don't have anything else. As Abraham and Isaac were going up to the, the mountain to sacrifice, and this, we're getting to this story. It's one of the next ones. He said, son, my God will supply himself a lamb. Faith and confidence in God. Can I show you a verse that is so powerful? Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. He's the beginning. The firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Do you know what the preeminence means? And I, I, I love that word because it just literally means in all things that God will be first. But I think we live more of the revelation when he talks about the church of Laodicea, the, the last church mentioned before the rapture in the, in, the, in the book of Revelation. He said, you know the problem is that you've been increased with goods and you think that you have need of nothing, but he said, you, you, have, you have left your first love. Have we become that generation that literally has stockpiled God's blessings and then when we talk about things, we almost tip God or give God the leftovers of what we had. And we wonder why we're not experiencing exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We wonder why we're not abounding and feeling the fulfillment. We're wondering why we don't hear the lion's den and, and, and feel the, <clears throat> the wind blowing over and, and, and experience the power of God as he worked in every situation as, as, as they prayed to experience the touch and power of God. You say, God doesn't work that way. Could it be that the fact that God is no longer the preeminence of our lives? Let's walk through this. Is he first in your time? Does Facebook, Hulu, Netflix, <clears throat> TikTok get more of your time than God? If it comes to us talking about and <clears throat> doing an outreach, and there was a competition between the Buckeye game and reaching our community, which one would win? Think of how often this happens. It comes to sleeping in on Sunday versus going to church. When it comes to our talents, the fact that we will play sports, but you have the talent and ability to play in the band, but you will, you will dedicate yourself to practicing that sport and living that out, but you will not pick up, pick up that instrument that God's blessing you with to bring glory to God. 
Is God first in that? You use your talents and abilities to do so many things, but you won't be part of the creative team to spread the gospel around the world. And let's just be honest, because it does apply to our money. And I think the reason that the Bible talks about money more than any other subject in the Bible is because that's close to our hearts. Have a pastor start talking about money and watch people cringe. But the sad thing is it's not even my message. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just the preacher. But preachers will begin to talk about money and the fact that God says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you get upset about the pastor talking about money, it's a heart issue. Because God has made a, an established thing from the very beginning. I will not take second place. I am the author. I'm the beginning. I created it. I spoke it. It's here because of me. I will not take second place. Do not put God in the back seat. Do not give him leftovers. Do not give to Starbucks and Hulu and a a Apple Music and everything else that we have a subscription to. And they get bitter and upset when God says support missions for the gospel to go out. Abel had his heart right. And Abel simply put God first. And God says, write that story down because that's how I work. With heads bowed and eyes closed, this might not be how you thought the sermon series would start. Because man, we love the David and Goliath moments and we, we love hearing about Elijah. I love how Gideon was able to bring down an army with 300 people and just props in his hand. But God didn't start with any of those stories. God started with somebody that just said, man, I, I, I need your heart first. I need your heart. For where your treasure is there, will your heart be also. We talked about the different things that God is doing and how God works, but I promise you this. Unless we have a heart for God, you'll never foot, take a foot step of faith onto that bridge. You'll never make a move because our brains will tell us that that's crazy. But I'll tell you, God works through crazy moves of faith. We're going to sing a song, and then we're going to have baptism. But I'm going to ask you as you sit, you pray, ask God this question, is he first? Is God first? Not a matter of just, oh, of course he is. No, no, no. Do you demonstrate this through your life? If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, maybe you identify with Eli's story as he was on the screen today. Uh, you don't know for sure if you'd go to heaven or hell. But man, God allowed him in that moment as he was seeking after God, he was questioning, what is God? That God opened the door for him to hear the truth. Have you ever thought that maybe this is your moment that God brought you here today to hear the truth? So respond as God gives you. I'll be standing right here. If anybody wants to come pray with me, I'll pray with you. If you want to come pray at the altar, we'll do that. God, bless in this service, bless in this invitation. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Let's all stand and sing.
question. If God was to ask you one question, if there was one takeaway from today's message that you learned from Abel in your life, Hebrews chapter 11, verse four, if God looked down at us and simply said to you, where do I rank in your life? If he said that, where do I fit in? It's like, God, I'm busy, okay, with your time. Where do I fit in? Like, well, you're first. God says, no, 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 I don't, I don't. Your, your words are one thing. Your actions are another. Where do I fit? When it comes to your talents, your abilities, you say, man, I, I do this and I do that and I have this talent and I have this skill and whatever. And God says, but for me, where do I fit into that? Well, God, I'm so busy. No, no, you're not that busy because you just told me all the things you do. Where do I fit in? Same thing with our finances, same thing with our passions. Where does God fit in? Let's, let's work through in our hearts and minds that this week. Because I promise you, we're not here just to hear a message. The Bible says be doers of the word and not hearers only. Let's pray. God, we thank you, God, for the word of God, for this, this guy named Abel. That Lord had so much faith. And he took what little he had and laid it on the altar because he acknowledged that all that he had came from you. And anything that follows must come from you. So Lord, help us to acknowledge that we have to seek ye first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. And then all these things shall be added unto us. Lord, thank you for Eli, for his testimony. And Lord, for this visual that you've given us of baptism to acknowledge the work that you've done in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. All right, church, this is Eli. Can we give him a hand? So more importantly than even giving Eli a hand, uh, we want to give the Lord a hand that can reach into somebody's life and change them from the inside out. Can we just praise the Lord for what he's doing? Eli is coming today to get baptized, and if this is your first time watching a baptism or uh, maybe you're new to church, uh, this water is uh, a little warm, a little cold at the bottom today. It's just normal Columbus water, though. This water doesn't save you. This water doesn't wash away your sin. Our sins can only be washed away when we place our faith in Jesus, and his blood washes away all of our sin. It's applied to our account. And so Eli, when he stands here, though he is a human and he is imperfect as we all are, he stands before God as righteous, as a saint, as a new believer in Christ. And I'm excited to baptize him today and just give testimony of that. So Eli, have you received Jesus as your savior? Awesome. Well, it's my privilege to baptize you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. We'll get a picture here. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you. It has been done as the Lord commanded, and we're also glad to have Eli's family with us today. Let's give them a hand for coming. All right, man. That is so awesome. Uh, come back next week. We have more baptism, more people that God's working in their life. Because when, when lives encounter the gospel, lives are changed. Now water didn't do it. Jesus did it from the inside out. That, that baptism water is just a representation of what God did. It's just a visual of it. I, I'm thankful that um, we're, we're making steps forward for the gospel. If you've heard about this for the gospel project, we're, we're stepping into a, a, a season of faith for us as a church. We've got a lot of things around here that need to be fixed. A problem that we have struggled with for a long time for us as a church is the fact that our buildings have not been handicapped accessible. Getting people from one place to the other has to be done a lot of times outside to walk around our buildings and things because we have no way to get people that are handicapped from one building to the other. I'm thankful for the, the proposal that we have for the gospel project that we're going to do. It's going to be putting a ramp permanently over here and people that come up here for whether it's a baby dedication, giving their testimony, speak, uh, graduation Sunday, whatever. If they're handicapped, they're able to get on this stage and be able to participate. Right now, we just don't have the means to be able to do that. In the lobby, one of the things that we're going to do is the steps that go up to Big City. We're going to cut those steps in half, and half of it can be turned into a lift to make it handicap accessible. The kids and adults can get from one building to the next because everybody deserves to be part of everything that we do. 
Next Sunday, we vote on this project. It won't be in the morning, it'll be in the afternoon or evening at five o'clock. It's a business meeting that we're a special business meeting that we're calling for this specific project. And we have to have your approval to move forward. We'll go through the details of it online even today that you'll get an email that ex explains who can vote. You have to be an active member of our church. This is just what our constitution spells out for us. And then we'll be doing that next Sunday afternoon at five o'clock. The following Sunday, October 8th, is our commitment Sunday. We have two plans for that day or two parts of this. Uh, one, we're going to take up a one-time offering that we're going to give towards the beginning of this. We're asking you to pray and ask God, what does he want you to do? To take a step of faith, to take a step into the unknown in some aspects of this of just saying, Lord, we don't even know what's going to happen, but we trust you. And then we're going to do a three-year commitment, asking God to carry us through this project, to knock this out so that we can further the gospel. We have those brochures available. If you did not get one that lays out, it's like a, a trifold that way, lays out exactly what we're doing, the plans, uh, the different aspects of the project and things like that. We want to make sure that you get one of those. If you're here today, I want to make sure that you take your next step, whatever it is. That was Lee, Eli taking his next step. What is your next step? Should it be to get involved in a ministry of our church? At the Next Steps table in the back as you're leaving, you can't miss it. They're there to help you. Maybe you haven't been baptized and you say, I've been struggling with this for a long time. Maybe you need to talk to somebody because you don't have assurance of your salvation. Just don't leave here today without taking those next steps. You can also sign up for all the things that we have going on in our church through the Church Center app. You can check in, sign up for baptism, sign up for starting point, and those kind of things. Don't forget that we have the new church merch. We're so excited about this. It starts spiritual conversations. You wear a shirt that talks about Jesus, and I promise you somebody will question that. Whether they're for or against it, they're gonna, you're going to have a conversation started in the community. And we love that aspect of this. And as a closing, uh, we had one of our dear members of our church pass away this past week. Roger Kirby passed away suddenly. He had a blood clot in his lungs. And, um, and, and they, they thought it was some different things. And by the time he went to the hospital, he passed away unexpectedly. And just pray for Mary and the family. His service will be at O.R. Woodyard this coming Saturday, September 30th. Uh, visitation from, from 11 to 1, and then the services at 1. Uh, Roger and Mary were one of the couples that left here uh, with Mike Myers and Melinda to go start Sunshine Mission, that they went to be that church and ministry there. So they kind of have dual citizenship, and he's been a big part of that ministry there, and he's going to be truly missed. Let's pray for them at this time as we get ready to close. God, I lift up Mary. And God, I know that this is heavy on her heart as I just talked to her yesterday. Lord, I know to be absent from the bodies and be present with the Lord. But Lord, I also know, Lord, that it is... It's, it's, it's a gap in our life. It's, it's a change in our life, Lord, that is it's just different. God, I thank you, Lord, for his life, his ministry, and most of all, his testimony of knowing Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. God, thank you for today, for Eli, for Matt, for the testimony that we heard. Lord, I'm excited about hearing another one next week and seeing how you're working. Thank you, God, for blessing us with a church that has a heart for the gospel. We pray these things in your name. Amen. If you're a guest with us today, I'd love to see you in Connecting Point. I'm going to head there right now. You are dismissed.